So I guess my question is, it, does that make sense that the, that the self abidance can event maybe eventually become just some a place we like to go, but rather but instead of being like a like a practice? Yes, yes. I think I said this morning that being doesn't need to be told to abide in itself. So even the, the pretty much the highest formulation of the teaching would be abide as that. There are other other things one could say, but that would be a, about as minimal and higher teaching as one could have, apart from just being silent. But even the suggestion abide is that who needs to be told to abide as being? But being doesn't obviously need to be told that. So even the suggestion abide as being is a, a concession, albeit a very slight one, to the self that seems not yet to be abide, abiding as being, but might do so. It's one step off the top of the mountain. Two steps off the top of the mountain would be investigate who you really are. Who am I? But even even that would be a just a very minimal concession. But abide as being is a very small concession, and, and both these concessions, or, or all the, the various concessions that the different teachings make, they're, they're all valid. They're all legitimate at certain stages of understanding. But but you're right. Um, there is this pull. You, you, you're, you're engaged in experience, and then there's a pause in the flow of your experience. Your attention is no longer required by the world. And there's a pause. And in pause, most people, in that pause, the mind comes to an end. And the ego comes to an end. So in order to reassert itself, in order to perpetuate itself, in that pause, when the mind is not required by the world, the ego will manufacture something to, be, to get busy with, some kind of a daydream, so to keep the mind perpetually going and therefore to perpetuate the ego. But in a, in a truth lover such as yourself, when, the, when your mind is not required by the world, then in that pause, the, the, the gravitational pull is just back to your being. You just want to go straight back there. And you're right, you don't, you don't really have to practice that because you, you, you are your being already. But there is a, there is a repull, you, you feel it as a, as a desire to return to your deepest self. It's not really a return, we understand we are already that, but, but, but it, it's, like a, it's just like the gravitational pull of your being. It's the gravitational pull of God's presence in your heart that just brings your attention back to itself when our attention is not required by the world. And it just, that, that pull gets stronger and stronger. To begin with, in the early stages when we're still infatuated with the content of experience, we have, seem to have to discipline ourselves to go there. But the more we go there, the more acquainted we become with our being and its innate peace and joy, that, that this pull, it just, just this gravitational pull that just keeps pulling us back. Mm. And we get, we're more and more reluctant to leave our being in favor of experience. Mm. And we begin to find ourselves established as that. But then when we're in experience, when we've been abiding in that place, do you notice there's just like a that, that there's a seamlessness? There's a seamlessness, yes, because to begin with, there's this back and forth. It's either experience or or your being. But in in, in, in and in this case, being experience still retains the capacity to take you away from yourself or to veil yourself. But as being as experience becomes more more transparent, it loses its veiling power. And then you find that in the midst of experience, you remain as being. And then the distinction between um, being on retreat and being at home, between meditation or being at work, it, 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 you, it's, all the, 
In the Zen, they call it one taste. It's just one taste. Yeah. Everything tastes of being. Right. Wherever you are, whatever you are experiencing, that the primary taste of that experience is being. Right, it reminds me of the Dzogchen master, who uh, think Longchen Rabjam, who says, wherever I look, it is the same. Or he, he talks it. about yeah. seamless sameness. Yes, it's the same. The Sufis say, wherever I look, wherever the eye falls, there is the face of God. In the Vedantic tradition, the, the, the one, you see the one self in everything. It's, it's exactly... Experience, has, experience becomes progressively and increasingly transparent to its reality. Yeah. The very experience that once seemed to veil reality now shines with it. Yeah. And therefore the distinction between experience and reality, the foreground and the background, experience and being, objects and awareness, that distinction, it was once an important distinction to make. For one who was lost in the content of experience, it was necessary to draw attention to the witness of experience behind and independent of that content. But that's only if we grant experience a veiling power. But once it loses that power, once it becomes transparent, then the, then the, the background, the reality, shines in the experience as the experience, not just behind it. That's the tantric approach. Right, right. And I'll just share with everyone, one of my goals, if we can call it a goal for this retreat, is that I know I'm going to be here with all these lovely people and probably get kind of blissed out and you know it's going to be really sweet but my one of my goals is to actually when I go home to know and feel and experience that nothing's changed exactly the same that's a beautiful intention to, to yeah. go home from here intentions better word than no goal. it's a beautiful yeah. <laughs> it, it's a beautiful intention just just to go home from here and barely notice the difference yes. Yeah, yes exactly yeah. Thank you, Roberta.